Then Moses spoke the words of this song until they were finished in the ears of all the assembly of Israel. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. Let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass and like showers upon the herb. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his ways, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you, your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the numbers of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him, he cared for him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions, the Lord alone guided him. No foreign god was with him. He made him ride on the high places of the land, and he ate the produce of the field, and he suckled him with honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock curds from the herd and milk from the flock, with fat of lambs, rams of bashan and goats, with the very finest of the wheat, and you drank foaming wine made from the blood of the grape. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, stout, and sleek. Then he forsook God who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. They stirred him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord saw it and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faithfulness. They have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are no people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled by my anger and it burns to the depths of Sheol, devours the earth and its increase and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. And I will heap disasters upon them. I will spend my arrows on them. They shall be wasted with hunger and devoured by plague and poisonous pestilence. I will send the teeth of beasts against them with the venom of things that crawl in the dust. Outdoors, the sword shall bereave, and indoors terror for young man and woman alike, the nursing child with the man of grey hairs. I would have said, I will cut them to pieces. I will wipe them from human memory, had I not feared provocation by the enemy, lest their adversaries should misunderstand, lest they should say, our hand is triumphant. It was not the Lord who did all this. For they are a nation void of counsel, and there is no understanding in them. If they were wise, they would understand this. They would discern their latter end. How could one have chased a thousand, and two have put ten thousand to flight, unless their rock had sold them, and the Lord had given them up? For their rock is not as our rock. Our enemies are by themselves. For their vine comes from the vine of Sodom and from the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of poison, their clusters are bitter, their wine is the poison of serpents and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me, sealed up in my treasuries? 
Vengeance is mine and recompense for the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand and their doom comes swiftly. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. When he sees that their power is gone and there is none remaining, bond or free, then he will say, where are their gods, the rock in which they took refuge? Who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering? Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your protection. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and swear as I live forever, if I sharpen my flashing sword and my hands takes hold on judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries and will repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the long-haired heads of the enemy. Rejoice with him, O heavens, bow down to him, O gods, for he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's land. Moses came and recited all the words of this song in the hearing of the people, he and Joshua, the son of Nun. Thank you, B, so much for reading so well for us as well. Um, what a treat to hear the word of God um, read so well. Thank you, um, T, for uh, coming this morning. Um, it's a privilege for me to be able to um, begin our time together in this first word work session. Um, now, if you've joined us over the last couple of years online, um, you'll already know the format. Um, Nigel uh, just helped us with it. Um, this first session is going to be exegesis. Um, I'm going to take you, if, if you like, to my study and try to show you how I worked and prayed and worked uh, try to hear this part of God's words, um, uh, try to take you to my study. And then after that, uh, well, I'll expand the text. And if I've got any energy left at the end of the morning, I'll have a go at answering some of your questions. That's the, the general format for this morning. I guess we hope that it will model the fact that we think that really good preaching uh, comes from, well, comes from listening carefully to what God has said. And this year, though, uh, we thought that we might try and tackle the question of uh, canonical exegesis. Um, in other words, um, how you read any part of the Bible in the light of the whole canon. Um, we are committed to the thought that the right context for reading any part of the Christian scriptures is in the context of the whole Bible, um, Old and New Testaments. And so we want to preach every part of the Bible um, in a way that shows that we understand that our passage, our text, is part of that bigger whole. Uh, the question is, though, what, what does that mean? And we've picked three passages this year for our word work in the mornings that we hope might help us to begin to get a handle on that question. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 32, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, Hannah's prayer, um, and then Mary, the Magnificat, in Luke uh, chapter 1. And they're all big songs or, or prayers. And as big songs or prayers, they're all canonically significant in their own right. Um, each of them provides within the context of Deuteronomy and Samuel and Luke part of the frame through which we're encouraged to read that part of the scriptures. Um, each of them creates ripples that then sort of flow out into the rest of the Bible. Uh, they're canonically significant, but they're also canonically linked. They're connected. Um, Hannah in 1 Samuel, is riffing on Moses' song in Deuteronomy 32. Uh, and Mary, in Luke chapter 1, well, she's riffing on Hannah's prayer from 1 Samuel 2. And so we hoped that by taking passages that were canonically significant and also canonically interlinked, we might begin to get some sort of a handle on what it looks like uh, to expand the Bible canonically. Uh, it's fallen on me uh, to begin with Deuteronomy uh, chapter 32. Now, at this point, the Cornhill students here uh, from the last few years will probably have a bit of a wry smile on their face. Of course, Willem is doing Deuteronomy 32. The man is obsessed. Um, in fact, uh, last year when the ministry trainees at my church finished, they gave me this 
um, as a leaving present. You probably can't see it. It wouldn't help you much if you could. It's a Deuteronomy 32 jigsaw puzzle. Uh, what it has is the text of Deuteronomy 32 and then a white background. It's actually surprisingly difficult. I have done it once. I might have another go again. Of course I'm doing Deuteronomy 32. But, but what does it look like to interpret Deuteronomy 32 canonically? And I have to say that when I first began to think about this, well, I was tempted to panic. A canonical panic, is that a thing? Um, um, I can say that uh, Andrew, um, who will be speaking tomorrow morning, and Ben, who will be speaking on Thursday, they can both testify to the fact that when we first met together um, to begin to share our thoughts on this passage, I turned up and I was like some sort of out-of-control machine gun, just firing connections in every possible direction. Um, uh, this unprocessed heap of cross-references. Um, so I'd come up with backward connections. Don't take a note. Um, it'll, it'll destroy you. But backwards connections to Genesis 1 and 3 and 10 to 18 and 19 and Jacob's blessings in Genesis 49, to Exodus 1, 3, 15, 17, 19, 32, 33, and 34, to Leviticus, at least chapter 16, but probably a good deal else, and also to Numbers 11 and 14, 23 and 24, Deuteronomy 4, 6, 8, 10, and 29. And I've actually forgotten some really important ones. Um, and then, at least as abundantly, forward connections, and um, forward connections to, so I'll go back aside, to uh, 1 Samuel 2 and 2 Samuel 22 and 23. Well, I've already mentioned those. And then to Isaiah, uh, chapters 1, 34, 35, 41, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 59, 61, 63, Jeremiah 2 and Ezekiel 21. You can tell that I don't know Jeremiah and Ezekiel as well as I know Isaiah. Hosea and Habakkuk and Proverbs 1 to 9 and 30 to Psalms, at least Psalm 93 to 100, probably Psalm 14 um, and the time that Psalm 14 gets repeated. And then every psalmic reference to the rock. And I haven't even reached the New Testament yet. I mean, leaving aside um, Hebrews and uh, Luke and John, um, did you know that Paul, in his epistle to the Romans, quotes from Deuteronomy 32 not once, not twice, but three times? Did you know that the first ever Christian sermon ends with an allusion to Deuteronomy 32? A canonical panic. Now, let me be clear. All of those connections... They really are there, um, and a good many more. But the trouble is that just, just spotting connections, it's not really doing exegesis, is it? Uh, we've got a pad full of notes, uh, but we haven't really learned anything more about what Deuteronomy 32 is, about what it's about. Uh, does this metaphor work? It's as though I've got a pile of multicolored threads on the floor in front of me, but I don't know whether it's a flag or a carpet, or a coat. And if you don't know whether it's a coat, or a flag, or a carpet, then you can't use it. You don't know what to do with it. If we don't know what the Bible, what the scriptures are for, if we don't know what God's purpose is in this part of the scriptures, then we, well, we can't really preach, or at least not well. And so the very first thing that I needed to do and after my moment of panic, was to sort of slightly put my notepad full of canonical connections to one side, um, at least for the time being, and to go back to basics. Uh, what do we have in front of us in Deuteronomy chapter 32? And the first thing to say is that Deuteronomy 32 is a song. Uh, Deuteronomy 32 is a song. Now this is obvious, isn't it? Um, it's the way that it's introduced at the end of chapter 31, um, uh, Moses spoke the words of this song until they were finished in the ears of all the assembly of Israel. Uh, and it's the way that it um, is summarized when it finishes. Uh, Moses and Joshua, uh, they recited all the words of this song in the hearing of the people. Um, he and Joshua, the son of Nun. Uh, the fact that this is a song, though, it might begin to get you to think a little bit about what it's for. Uh, what the purpose is. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, it's not just there to be an index to other Bible passages. Perhaps the fact that this is a song, well, what are songs for? It's a question I hadn't really thought about, but Ben said, what do you think the purpose of this is, given that it's a song? And whatever you'd include in the list of things that you might do with singing, memory must be quite near the top. Uh, just ask a children's worker. Um, I've got a friend who has learned Deuteronomy 32 
by heart. Um, I haven't done that, although I do have a jigsaw puzzle. Um, uh, they've learned Deuteronomy 32 by heart. But there's one part that I will never forget. Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, and all his ways are just. And why will I never forget that bit? Well, because of the 1989 chorus. Uh, someone turned this song into a song. They also got royalties for it, um, at the 1989 chorus. Uh, because, in other words, I know the tune. And might the fact that this is a song, or might it have something to do with remembering? And sure enough, um, as I began to work a bit harder, I saw that that must be right. Um, Deuteronomy 31, it's basically a chapter of, well, at least half the chapter is an introduction to the song in chapter 32. And there's a whole lot of chat in 31 about what Deuteronomy 32 is going to be for. Um, And this is how the Lord introduces the song. Uh, When many evils and troubles have come upon them, uh, this song, here we go, shall confront them as a witness, for it will live unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring. And once you've seen that at least part of the purpose of this song is to be remembered, uh, you see that memory and forgetting that there are actually major themes in the chapter as it unfolds. Um, And so um, uh, Moses begins, verse 7, remember the days of old. Um, Their big sin as a people is that they were unmindful of the rock that bore them. Uh, They forgot of the God who gave them birth. Um, Even God's judgment on them for their forgetfulness is that he threatens to wipe them from human memory. And in fact, once you've noticed that, you see that there's a whole load of other vocabulary that's really to do with remembering or forgetting, so foolishness and wisdom, uh, discernment and understanding, uh, lacking knowledge as you go through. It seems like uh, whatever this song is for, um, at rock bottom, it's something to do with remembering. It's about remembering, and it's to be remembered. Well, we can already begin to draw a little bit our thoughts together at this point. Um, uh, We've got Deuteronomy 32, and I've got some sort of a sense of, of what it is. It's a song. And the purpose is, uh, remember, what is it that Deuteronomy 32 wants us to remember? Well, the second thing to notice is that it's a song with a theme. Uh, Deuteronomy uh, 32, verses 3 and 4, uh, Moses does what all good Cornhill students uh, really ought to do. He comes up with a theme sentence, um, and like all beginning Cornhill students, um, he puts his theme sentence at the beginning of the talk, just in case The rest of the talk doesn't spell it out. Um, For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our gods, the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. Now, there's two different ways you could come at this. What is the theme of this song going to be about? Well, you could take that first line, I'll proclaim the name of the Lord. Um, And sure enough, as you read through um, the song, um, that name of the Lord, it comes up eight times. Um, in the rest of Deuteronomy 32. Or, alternatively, uh, you could focus on this next word, which also comes up eight times, um, the rock. Um, And that comes up eight times um, in the rest of the song. In fact, I think you're probably supposed to put them together, that the theme of this song is the Lord's as the rock. Uh, Where does the rock come up? Well, uh, not quite all of them are about the Lord, although all of them are significant. Um, Verse 4, we've noticed the rock, um, his work is perfect. And then verse 13, and he suckled him with honey out of the rock. Well, that's an arresting image, isn't it? Uh, verse 13, and oil out of the flinty rock. Verse 15, he forsook the rock of his salvation. Verse 18, you were unmindful of the rock that bore you. Verse 30, unless their rock had sold them. Uh, verse 31, for their rock is not as our rock. And um, Verse um, 31, um, and we've seen that this is a, a song that it's about a theme, and the Lord's as the rock. It's a song about a rock. I suppose you could say it's a, it's a rock song. <laughs> Let's draw things together a little bit. Um, so uh, now we've got a theme, um, a theme, the rock, and a purpose. Our purpose is remember the rock. But just at this point, it's possible to panic again. In fact, people often do panic at this point. Um, and to go on a rock hunt. Uh, What do we mean when we say that the Lord's is a rock? Well, there are a lot of rocks in the Bible. Um, Hannah and David, they both sing to the rock in the book of Samuel. Um, The Lord is a rock in Psalms. You ready? 
18, 19, 27, 28, 31, 61, 62, 71, 73, 78, 81, 89, 92, 94, 95, 105, 114, and 144. It's very important that you got all of those down, by the way. Um, there's the rock uh, where Gideon encounters the angel in the book of Judges, and another rock similarly where Samson's parents do. Uh, there's the rock of Adullam where David hides. Job wants his words to be written on a rock. Isaiah makes a lot of the rock, um, actually. Peter himself is the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And of course, the rock takes center stage in what must count as ground zero for exegetical panic, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Now again, lots of those connections are real, um, and almost all of them are important, but I don't think that they're the best place to start um, when we try to understand what this song means by singing about the Lord's the rock. And the reason is because they don't help us to understand what Moses and Joshua and the people of Israel would have understood this song to mean as they sang it. Well, what does it mean to say that the Lord is the rock here? What would the singers of this song have thought they were singing about for the hundreds of years that they sang it? Well, as a starter for 10, you might think that it's a simple metaphor. Um, here is a rock um, that I picked up uh, on the way to work the other day. It's quite a good rock, although I realize now that I probably should have got a bigger one. Um, uh, a rock I picked up. And you might think um, that there are Things about this rock that help us to understand what the Lord is like. It's a simple metaphor. So what is a rock like? Well, it's enduring um, to all intents and purposes. It is indestructible. Um, it is solid. Um, it's a foundation that you might build on. Um, if you were to find a big enough one, it's something that you might hide behind. Um, if you were to collide with a rock, um, well, you would probably come off worse. Now, something of that does seem to be in play as the song unfolds. We're told at the beginning that the Lord is a God of faithfulness. And you might think, okay, that's right. That's kind of like a rock. Um, I mean, rocks aren't quite faithful, but they are constant and unchanging. And um, the Lord is certainly very ancient because um, we're told to remember the days of old. And the Lord, well, the implication is that he's a good refuge in verse 37 because they should have taken refuge in him, although in fact they didn't. But there are some respects as you go through the song in which the Lord is kind of conventionally rock-like. But actually, I think it's very striking that overall, the rock in this song is not conventionally very rock-like at all. So go back to that most striking verse. Um, he suckled him with honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. I mean, both of that, a suckling rock and a rock that flows with honey and with oil. That's not very conventionally rock-like. It's a rock that bears children, a rock that gives birth in verse 18. It's a rock that um, can get angry, uh, can spurn his people, and a rock that can kindle with fire. Verse 30, it's a rock that sells people. And then leaving the, the rock itself, its unrockiness to one side, notice the mixed metaphors as you go through the chapter. As well as a rock, the Lord is a father, and an eagle, and a fire, and a hunter, and a sword wielder, and an archer, and also an avenger. On balance, you'd have to say that the comparison between any old rock, um, this rock, and the Lord's in Deuteronomy 32, it only gets you so far. And so is there a bit more to say? And at this point, I thought it might be worth doing a bit more digging. Um, not forwards into Job and Isaiah, um, not yet, but backwards into Deuteronomy and Exodus. Backwards because that might help us to understand what Moses and the people who first sang this song would have taken the rock to mean. And so I got out my Bible software and I did a search on all the times that the word translated here as rock has come up in the Bible so far. And I found two very interesting things. I found them interesting anyway. The first 
is that the Lord has not been described as a rock before this in the Pentateuch. It is a new thought. This song is the moment that coins the thoughts. Nevertheless, though, secondly, there has been a rock in the first five books of the Bible that you might describe as the rock. Um, And it comes up in three places. And first of all, there's Exodus chapter 17 and verse 6. Uh, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. And you shall just ring Horeb, that's important. And you shall strike the rock. Um, Let me remind you where we're up to, if you're rusty on Exodus. And the Lord has rescued Israel from Egypt. Uh, They're just on the way to Mount Sinai to receive the law. Um, uh, They're in the desert, and they run out of water in chapter 15, and bread in chapter 16, and water again here in chapter 17. And they grumble, but the Lord provides for them. And Moses strikes the rock, and water flows out from the rock. That's the first reference to the rock in the Bible. The second is a few chapters later in Exodus chapter 33. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put a cleft, I put you in a cleft of the rock, and I'll cover you with my hands until I've passed by. And now Israel is at Mount Sinai, and they have received the law, and then they've catastrophically broken it by worshipping an idol, the golden calf. And the Lord has been provoked to anger and he sent plagues and sword against them. But Moses has interceded and the Lord has relented. And here in chapter 33, the Lord is just about to proclaim his name, the Lord. Just like Moses proclaims God's name, the Lord, in Deuteronomy 32, in fact. The Lord is just about to proclaim his name, the Lord, and to pass by. And he gives Moses a place to hide, a cleft in the rock. And here's the third reference. It comes in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And Moses now is recapping all the ways that the Lord has looked after them as he's led the people of Israel through the wilderness. Um, and um, he goes back to Exodus 17, and he reminds them of Exodus 17. He says this, The Lord led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, and he brought you water out of the flinty rock. Three references um, in the first five books of the Bible to a rock that you might justifiably describe as the rock. Uh, The really striking thing is that all three of these passages are actually referring to the same rock. I mean, Deuteronomy 8 is obviously referring to the same rock um, as Exodus 17 because it's a recap. Uh, He's going back over what happened in Exodus 17. But the thing that I hadn't properly processed until I thought about it, is that Exodus 17 and Exodus 33 are also both talking about the same rock. Uh, They both happen at the same place. Uh, Chapter 17, the rock at Horeb. Um, And if you know your Bible geography, you know that Horeb is the same place as Sinai, and you know that Exodus 33 is at Sinai. And so the rock, well, the rock is the mountain. The rock is Mount Sinai. The rock is Mount Horeb. And here's the point. If at any point in uh, the Bible up until now, before Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 30, you had told people to remember the rock, the rock that they would likely have remembered was the Sinai rock and the Horeb rock, the mountain. And so is this song trying to get us to remember the rock, the Lord, by remembering the rock, Sinai? Now, at this point, of course, um, you've got to ask the question. Um, I've connected two rocks. Um, The Lord is a rock, and Sinai is a rock. And the question I need to ask myself is this, uh, and this goes for every canonical connection you could possibly make. Um, Is that a real connection, or is it just in my head? Uh, Because just because you can connect two things in the Bible, it doesn't mean that you necessarily should. Um, Are there good reasons to think that this connection is really there, and that the Lord's purpose um, in this song is to connect his rockiness to Sinai's rockiness? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, To begin with, it explains some of the 
not especially rock-like properties of the rock in Deuteronomy 32. We've already noticed how verse 13 is so striking. He suckled him with honey out of the rock and with oil out of the flinty rock. And we notice that that is not very conventionally rock-like, um, either to go about suckling people um, or to flow with honey or oil. It's not especially rock-like, but it is rock horeb like In fact, Moses uses almost exactly the same phrase in Deuteronomy 32 um, as he used back in chapter 8, water out of the flinty rock, oil out of the flinty rock. Actually, quite a lot of the unrock-like rockiness of the Lord's comes straight out of what happened at Mount Sinai. So a rock that is also an eagle. Well, of course, we know that at Sinai, um, the Lord said that he bore them there on eagle's wings, Exodus chapter 19. A rock with a flashy, literally a lightning sword. Well, again, we know that Mount Sinai flashed with lightning. A rock that kindles a fire. We'll see this more later, but a Sinai burned as the Lord descended on it in fire. A rock that is provoked to hot anger. Well, um, Exodus chapter 32, we know that at Sinai the Lord was provoked um, to burning hot anger. Um, a rock that relents and becomes a hiding place because it's afraid of the provocation of its enemies. Well, that's just what Moses prayed, isn't it, in Exodus 32. Uh, why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent, did you bring them out? And um, actually, the more you dig, I think, um, the more explanatory power this has. And so now I'm beginning to think, yes, that's it. When we say that the purpose of this song is to get you to remember the Lord as the rock, what we're saying is that the purpose of this song is to get you to remember God, the Lord, as the God of Sinai. The mountain is the most striking visual aid of the God of the mountain. Um, uh, it's beginning to make sense. Well, we can draw some things together at this point. Uh, what have we got? We've got a theme, the rock, um, but now we can spell out just a little bit more what that means. Uh, by the rock, we mean the Lord as the God of Sinai. And so we'll see that is the life-giving and judging and relenting gods. Um, and we've got a purpose, uh, remember the rock. And now we can say, well, okay, what we mean by remember the rock is to remember the Lord as he revealed himself at Mount Sinai. We've got a theme and we've got a purpose. We're beginning to get somewhere um, but you might be thinking, we're still pretty vague on the actual content of Deuteronomy 32. You've sort of pulled some random themes out and taken us on a verse chase. What does the song actually say? And how does this song address its theme? And how does it flow? Um, and the first thing to say about this is that this is a song that tells a story. And it's worth noting it's a story about the future. Um, as Moses introduces it again in chapter 31, um, he, he tells them it's all about stuff that's going to happen uh, well, after his death, and about stuff that's going to happen in days to come. Um, this is a song that's going to stretch into the next seven, eight, nine hundred years, a thousand years. It's all about uh, the future. And when you actually read Deuteronomy 32, you find, that, find out that the, the language of the distant future comes up a couple of times, um, uh, discerning their latter ends in verse 20 um, and verse 29. Uh, but it's not just some vague ideas about the future, a few sort of mystic Meg predictions and um, that sort of thing. Um, it is a song that tells a story, a story with a beginning and a middle and an end, um, a story with a story arc. Uh, so it's the beginning. Well, you have an introduction in the first five or six verses. And then in verses 6 to 14, you get the beginning, what you might call the golden days of the rock and Israel, how the Lord looked after them and tended them, and fed them. I suppose you could summarize that, I'm going to anyway, as creation and provision. And then in the middle, in verses um, uh, sort of 15 and following, things go very badly downhill, um, and uh, Israel turns away from the Lord. Jeshurun, verse 15, grew fat and kicked. Uh, verse 16, they stirred him to jealousy with strange gods. Verse 19, the Lord saw it and spurned them because of their provocation. And that goes right through to verse 27. And so this section is about their sin, their idolatry, and God's judgments. 
And then, though, it's not the end. And there's a turning point. It comes at verses 26 and 27. And the Lord says, I would have said, um, I will wipe them out from human memory had I not feared the provocation of the enemy. And from that moment on, so verse 26 and 27, um, the whole chapter turns um, and things begin to go uphill. Uh, First of all, in verse 28 to 33, well, you get this shift, and it's kind of subtle, but if you read it carefully, you'll, you'll see that it's no longer talking about Israel um, as a foolish nation in verses 28 to 33. It's now talking about their enemies as an equally foolish nation um, that share in their own misunderstanding, uh, 28 to 33. And by 34 to 43, things are completely reversed. Um, you have um, the Lord's compassion, uh, Um, his relenting concerning his people um, and his judgment of their enemies. Um, So I probably put that vengeance um, there. Um, There you go. So the the, the song as a whole, it it tells a story um, following this story arc. Now, as a preacher at this point, my eyes are lighting up and because um, I have just seen that there are three arrows there and three main sections, one, two, three... Oh, I can already work out that I've definitely got a sermon now, and that's all very helpful. Um, it's also worth noticing that it's a story with a, a happy ending, um, uh, that that's the, the story arc as you trace through. And this is worth noticing. Um, I've heard Deuteronomy 32 taught as though all it said was, Israel is a corrupt and foolish generation, and they deserve judgment. I've heard it taught that way. In fact, um, when I was starting to prep on this, I, I, I looked up on the internet and I found some Bible preaching notes, um, some notes on how to preach Deuteronomy 32, that suggested that the best way to preach this passage was to go, just go up to verse 18. And you might think that's very wise, given how long it is, and just stop there. But of course, if you stop at verse 18, you've really missed most of the story. Um, and you stop before you've even got halfway, in fact. Um, uh, and what this story is, it's not just a, a generic story, It is, in fact, as we've said, the story of the next thousand years, um, or more, I suppose you might say. When we talk about creation and provision, you could equally summarize that as the conquest, uh, what's ahead of Israel as they go into the land. And sin and judgment is the story of their apostasy and exile. And then the last bit, um, 27, 28 to the end, is the story of return, um, their return to the Lord and the prospect of um, their return uh, to the land, vengeance on their enemies, and verse 43, atonement for his people and for his lands. We've got a bit of a sense of what's going on in the chapter. It's Israel's history uh, told in advance. But the thing that's even more striking is that actually that story arc um, that is going to be their future um, in the rest of their history is also the story arc in the book of Exodus. Um, Exodus, when it tells the story of the rock, begins with the rock as a place of provision in Exodus 17. And then in Exodus, I guess you could say 19 through to 32, you get the rock as the fiery rock, uh, as a place of judgment, where they commit apostasy and they turn away from the Lord's and they incur his wrath, and he unleashes the sword and pestilence against them. And then in Exodus 33 and 34, the rock becomes a place of compassion, um, a rock of relenting. When you think about it, those are the three great Sinai moments, aren't they? Uh, The flowing rock, the fiery rock, the hiding rock. But the point is that the story of the next thousand years, going back here, that is the story of the rock in the book of Exodus. Um, I saw a great quote from uh, T.S. Eliot recently in My End is My Beginning. Actually, let me stop there. And that's um, enormously pompous. Um, It makes you think that I go about reading T.S. Eliot. I don't. Um, I was reading a book on Welsh rugby called Callon, um, and Owen Shears, he does read T.S. Eliot, um, and he noticed this quote, and it stuck with me. Um, In my end... Um, is my beginning. And it struck me because it it seems like that is what we say here. The the story of Israel's end, um, her next thousand years, is the story of her beginning. On the one hand, that is grim. 
uh, grim because she won't be any better in the future uh, than she was in the past. On the other hand, though, it's a reason for real hope. Uh, the Lord relented at the rock, and the rock will relent again. Well, we're nearly there. Um, we're making really good progress. Um, uh, let's draw some more things together. Again, we've seen that it's a song, and it's a song that has a theme. Uh, the theme is the rock, and we saw that that's not just a metaphor, but it's a way of referring to the Lord as he revealed himself as the God of Sinai, which we can now define as the life-giving, the judging, the relenting rock. Um, I guess you could say a bit more than that, um, that because it's not just about their past, but also about their future, God, as he revealed himself at Sinai, is the key not only to your past, but also to your present and your future. That's what the song is about um, as you read it. And it's a song with a purpose, a song, uh, a song that wants you to remember the rock. And of course, what that means is to remember the Lord's as he revealed himself at Sinai. And we've seen as well that there's this basic story arc, and we've begun to see that perhaps you can divide that into three main phases. Um, and uh, we're beginning to think now about what we might preach. Uh, but it seems to me that we're still not quite ready um, at this point. Um, I don't feel quite ready to preach because I still feel a bit vague about this. Uh, what does it mean to remember the rock? It sounds natty, uh, but what are we really saying? And as well as that, I want to come back to those canonical connections that we noticed at the start. Uh, what about all of them? Why are they there? Uh, I think if we get a little bit clearer about the purpose here, um, I think those canonical connections will really begin to pop. And so let's go back one more time to that verse that we had at the beginning. Um, remember that the Lord introduced the song by saying, when many evils and troubles have come upon them, this song shall confront them as a witness, for it will live unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring. And I want us to notice that little phrase I haven't put in bold there, it will confront them as a witness. It seems like the purpose of this song is not just that you remember, but that you remember something that will confront you as a witness. That idea of, of a witness, actually it comes up um, four times in Deuteronomy 31. And three of the references are to the song. So verse 19 and verse 21 we just read, uh, both of them describe this song as a witness. And then when Moses begins to sing, uh, just before chapter 32, um, again, he says that he's going to call heaven and earth as witness as he sings. And so three times the witness against them is the song. But there is another witness, uh, this one here in verse 26. Um, as well as the song, the other witness um, is the book of the law. Um, uh, they're instructed to write a book of the law and to put it by the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your gods, that it may be a witness against you. And I think the question that I'm asking at this point is, okay, so how does the fact that there are two witnesses and one of them is the book of the law, how does that help me to understand the specific role of this witness, the song that I'm trying to preach? And I think the key is to understand where the two witnesses are. Um, so the book of the law, well, that is going to be placed beside the Ark of the Covenant in the presence of God as a witness against the people there, uh, but of course, hidden away there beside the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle, um, it's likely going to be forgotten by the people, which is why the key thing about this song is that it will live unforgotten in the mouths of the people. Uh, the job of the song, um, well, the job of the song is to be there unforgotten so that it can confront them. Now, actually, when you read the song carefully, um, as I hope we're beginning to do, you realize that the very way that the song is written actually serves this purpose. And big chunks of the song talk about the Lord and Israel in the third person, about Israel in the third person, them, them, they, 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 them, them. And then suddenly you have these moments when the finger points out at you and it says you. And so take verse um, uh, 18 to 4, 8 to 14. There are 15 consecutive references to the Israel in the third person, and then suddenly in verse 14, you climactically uh, drank the foaming wine made from the blood of the grape. Uh, similarly, verses uh, 15 to 18, again, six more references to Israel as they. But then verse 18, you were unmindful of the rock that bore you, and you forgot the God that gave you birth. 
And again, 19 to 38, this time 24 references to Israel in the third person, um, as well as some other stuff about other nations in the third person too. And then suddenly, verse 38, let them rise up to help you. Let them be your protection. It's most striking of all that the beginning and the end of the story. Uh, so in verse 6, you get this very strong address um, to those who are singing the song. Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? And then at the end, see now, you see now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. See it now that I, even I, am he, even if you haven't seen it before. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hands. You see, this is a song that can lie dormant for generation after generation as they sing it, and then suddenly erupt, a bit like a mountain, I suppose. Uh, the climactic point um, is verse 39. Um, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hands. See, the thing that this song wants to confront us with face to face is God himself, uh, the rock. Israel will forget God, but the song will confront Israel with God again and again. So what is the role of this witness? Well, it is to be unforgotten, and it's to be unforgotten so that even as they sing it, it can kind of rise up to confront them And specifically, it is to confront them with God. See now that I, even I, am he, uh, the rock. It's probably worth noticing how raw this is and how ruthlessly focused um, uh, the, the focus is on God himself. We haven't noticed all the things that the song doesn't mention There are lots of allusions back to Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The whole point of this song is remembrance. It's a sort of precy of what they need to remember going forward. It's a summary. But what is striking, what's so striking, um, is what the song doesn't mention. So it doesn't mention the law or the commandments. I mean, that's astonishing as a summary of Deuteronomy, isn't it? It doesn't reference the Exodus out of Egypt, not explicitly. It doesn't mention the covenant with Abraham, and that's extraordinary. It doesn't mention the covenant at Sinai, not explicitly. Just the rock, God himself, the rock and his faithless people. Um, And this is important um, because the primary fact of Israel's history is not a covenantal scheme or a contract or the deed's consequence nexus. Uh, Look it up. It is a people and their gods. Um, And when it's boiled right down, it is with God himself, with God himself, that they need to be confronted. It confronts them specifically with gods. And actually, in confronting them specifically with gods, um, this witness is there to produce a happy ending. Actually, there is an apparent tension in the song. Maybe you noticed it as it was read. When you read the first couple of verses, may my teaching drop as rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass, and like showers upon the herb. I mean, it sounds like it's going to be a happy song, doesn't it? Um, Kind of lift music. Um, What a lovely song we're about to hear. And then what you get um, as Moses and Joshua sing is what appears at first blush to be a searing and unrelenting denunciation of a corrupt and foolish people. Now, I said that the arc of the story is towards a happy ending, and that's true, but even at the end, it never feels like a happy song. Um, it never feels smiley when you get to the last bits. How is it that this song, that is supposed to have a happy ending, can be so well, robust as a witness against the people with such a devastating tone? Of course, that's the point, isn't it? If only they can be brought to recognize, to see that their God really is God. With confrontation of their sin and his judgments, if that confrontation leads to recognition, 
It won't be the path to death. It will be the path to life. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. And of course, that leads us to the Lord Jesus. I will see tomorrow that one way to think about the way you might preach Deuteronomy 32 as a Christian um, is to track a bit with Hannah. Um, And one of the things that Hannah does um, is that she plugs the Messiah, the Lord's anointed, into a Deuteronomy chapter 32 shaped view of history. But but the other way that the New Testament uh, connects this song with Jesus is much, much more direct. Um, It's not so much that this song can be seen to be about the coming king, although in the end it kind of is. Um, Rather, it is that this song brings us face to face with God himself. Um, uh, The song's about, uh, the point of the song is that relenting and atonement, resurrection and healing will finally come from being brought face to face with the Lord's. And both Paul and John, um, in their different ways, they use Deuteronomy 32 to make exactly this point. Uh, Jesus shows up in John's Gospel, um, and you might know he, he says seven or nine times, driving you back to Deuteronomy 32 via Isaiah, I am he. Uh, it's a deliberate confrontation. Uh, we are confronted with the Lord, with God himself. And the confrontation in John's Gospel is this, if you will only acknowledge him a corrupt and twisted generation that you are, if you will only acknowledge him, he can bring you resurrection and life. And that's the line to the Lord Jesus that we'll be developing um, in just a moment. Well, let me draw our thoughts together. Um, First of all, we said something about the role of this witness, which is to live unforgotten, to confront, and to confront them specifically with God, which will ultimately be um, the Lord Jesus. Uh, More on that in a minute. Um, Secondly, uh, um, I think we're in a position to say something sensible now about the canonical connections. Um, Now, uh, we began with that absolute sort of explosion of backwards illusions and also forwards illusions. And hopefully now you can see that they make sense. Of course, there are all those backwards connections um, into the first five books of the Bible because the whole point of this song is to give a precy, a summary Um, of the most important truth, the theological heart of the first five books of the Bible, to be remembered and to confront them. Uh, Pracy, but with a radical refocusing on God, captured in this story of the rock. And the connections forwards, well, suddenly they make sense as well, don't they? Uh, Why is it that there are so many connections to Deuteronomy 32 and the rest of the Bible? Well, because that's the sign that this song has done its job um, as Um, David and Isaiah and Hannah and Ethan and Asaph and Habakkuk, um, as they lived through this story, they couldn't get this song out of their heads. It was working. And now I can understand why um, all of those later places in the Bible are so keen to keep singing the rock. Well, let's draw it together. And what have we got? We've got a song. We've got a song with a theme, um, the rock. And by the rock, we mean the God of Sinai, the life-giving, judging, relenting rock. Uh, We we mean the forgotten God of Sinai, as in the God you're inclined to forget, but who is nevertheless the key not only to your past, but also to your present and your future. Uh, And we've got a purpose, a purpose, remember the rock. I mean, that'll preach, won't it? Uh, Remember the rock. Uh, And by that, we mean that this song is written to confront us with the God that we are inclined to forget. Um, It's to confront us with the God that we forget um, the God of Sinai and to confront us with the God of Sinai as the key to our past and our present and our future and to confront us in order to produce repentance that leads to life. And we've got a story arc that goes with that in those three phases that begins to look a bit like it might be three points. Um, And I I know what I want to do as I preach. Um, I want to confront the people that I'm preaching to with this great fact that all of their past and present and future and all of their hope is bound up in the Lord himself. I've even got a text. I've seen now that I, even I, am he. And I think now, um, instead of the big pile of threads, I've now got the makings of a sermon. And you'll hear that after the break.